All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning to our students here and those online as well. Uh, it's good to be back. So uh, we'll pick up from where we where Pastor Ashish had stopped. I think he stopped in chapter four. So we begin with chapter five, right? Okay. So we're going to just look at uh, you know chapter five, and then we'll go on for the next on the next session also. But we're going to look at very practical insights, right? Uh, you know, I was listening to uh, the last uh, lecture, and uh, it, you know, it's good to be practical. The whole point of this course, urban church planting, is it is more of eighty percent of being practical and twenty percent of theory. But it, we need to have a good balance in that. So, so let's get into chapter five. Let's look at the natural dynamics of urban centers. Right now, what, what what do we mean by saying natural dynamics? When we say dynamics, um, okay, uh, in a song, right? If, if for example, uh, you're you're preparing for a song, the song has something called as dynamics. For example, you have intro, go into verse one. Verse one can be a strong verse, or it can be a softer verse. Then you have chorus, then you have verse two. The verse two can be a softer chorus with then repeat. I mean, sorry, verse two can be a softer verse. Repeat chorus, go strong, go into bridge, then outro. Right? So that's called song dynamics. Right? Now, in everything that we do, there's something called as dynamics. Things that work, things that don't work. All right. So when we look at urban centers uh, what are the natural dynamics that we can look at now very important if you look at our nation of india we are seeing almost 20 percent of villages moving into towns or becoming towns yes because i remember you know going into villages many many years back and there was no network right? you can't even make a call you had to go to a certain place near the town and make a call. But nowadays, even in villages, there is internet, there is uh, you know phone connection, everything is available. So we're seeing a shift in dynamics. No, even after COVID happened, we see that even villages have Zoom meetings, like online meetings, uh, and it's good. Because what's happening is from a village setting, we are moving into towns, and eventually towns will people will move into cities. So we're seeing a big shift in dynamics. But right now, we are in an urban city, right? If you look at the city of Bangalore, we are this is an urban city. Everything is you know already developed, people are uh, you know working professionals, it's, it's urbanized, right? Now, how do you and I plant a local church in an urban city. Like, what are some of the? Of course, we know that uh, you know everything that when it comes to a local church, it is more about praying, asking God to lead us. We need the leading of the Holy Spirit. But what are the natural things that you and I should do? What are the natural things, natural dynamics, right? So very important. Do your homework. Then we plan to do something, right? Whatever it is, do your homework. Uh, one of the things we tell our worship team, especially, is we tell them, "Hey, did you do your homework?" Because when they come on, if they come unprepared, without listening to the song, without learning the song, say, "Hey, you didn't do your homework," right? So, in the natural, we must do our homework. Meaning, now let's let's just take Bangalore for an example, right? Let's stick with Bangalore. You got the city of Bangalore, and it's a large population, right? You got millions of people in Bangalore. Now, in those millions of people, there are different sections. You got the English speaking, Hindi speaking, Tamil, Kannada, all the other language speaking. Now, then you've got different demographies, people who are working on, in, in business, people who are working in different sectors, right? Then you have the upper range, you have the middle range, and you have the uh, uh, lower range, 
right? So with the tools that we have right now, we begin to do our homework, right? So what do we have? We, the, I think the most simplest tool we have is Google. Go to Google. For example, if you want to start a church, right? Type in how to start a church in Bangalore. AI will give you a whole list on what we what we must do, right? So use tools that is already there available. So by na natural dynamics, what do we mean? Let's go to we're on page eight. The history of the city, meaning who, why, and when it was established. Now, we we may not know the details. Right? Now, if you ask me who established Bangalore, I'm not really sure. But get to know the history of the city. Right? What is the city known for? In the early 2000s, I remember, uh, I just finished my 10th standard. And this whole thing of tech parks came into existence. And, uh, suddenly, these you know, way back in um, Whitefield area, there were these huge glass buildings. And in 2000, in the year 2000, to have these glass buildings was a big deal. Now we see them everywhere. Huge glass buildings, and uh, I was really fascinated by looking at those buildings. Oh man, it looks like New York, and all of that. Uh, but then in 2000, there was a shift, meaning the IT sector began to, you know, come and launch their center in Bangalore. It all started with this one place in Whitefield, and I remember I got a job in one in oh, ITPL in Whitefield. And going into those big glass buildings and looking at the facilities and said, you, you, we actually felt that you were not in Bangalore. So you're in another country, right? Once you go in, everything is AC and, you know, carpeted, well carpeted, nice uh, tables and uh, everything was so nice. Now, what happened was there was a shift. All of a sudden, the city of Bangalore was looking at, you know, uh, going to a higher level in terms of its working place, working professionals. And from there, I remember the other tech park started, uh, I can name it, but then you may not know it. So there are different parks that started in different places in Bangalore. And, he, and now Bangalore is known as the IT hub. It's a highly IT hub of India. But here's the thing, when you talk to my, you know, when you talk to older folks, what do they say? Oh man, these people came and you know destroyed Bangalore. But I do remember in the 1990s, as a little boy, you know, one one of the things that really stuck with me was uh, the beauty of this city. It was it was very, very beautiful. There was not you know so much of uh, vehicles moving around, very beautiful place. But here are things that we must understand when it comes to ministry and urban church planting. Things will change. Whether you're in a city, whether you're in a town, whether you're in a village, things will change. We cannot expect to see, okay, see, we did this ministry 10 years back, let's do it the same way. It doesn't work. Things change, we need to be adaptable to how things change. Then you also understand the political environment, the civic administration and political environment in that place. Now, when you look at cities, the political environment, usually, you know, there's strife and all of that happening. But people are minding their own business. They go to work, come. Whoever, whichever government wins, you do what you want. We have to work. We have to feed our family. We'll do what we have to do. But... It's also important to understand what are the political uh, you know, governments and what is the environment in that certain place that you're planning to start a local church. Now, if it's Bangalore or you take a city like Hyderabad, Mumbai, we don't have to be worried. Just go plant a church. But if you look at towns and villages, right, we need to be careful. Okay, what should I do? What I shouldn't do? We have to go back and read Right? So one of the things that, um, if you notice on our website, one of our couple of outreach churches, uh, oh, we have mentioned their address not mentioned for security reasons. Right? So because there, it's we want people to be safe. 
it's not as free as in a city because persecutions are on the rise in, in all these towns and villages. So be wise. Right? OK, we are not going to. Uh, so we get an idea of what is happening in that town, city, or village that you uh, want to start a church in. And I get an understanding, OK, what government is there? What is What are the persecutions that happened earlier on? Right. Uh, I remember many years back, I think it was 2012, uh, we were heading to uh, Odisha for a, a conference, right? And um, it was not a conference, it was, I think it was the Bible College, the short term Bible College. And uh, I was reading about Orissa because I wanted to understand those people, right? I'm going to go teach in English and um, the topics that were given to me, but I wanted to understand where are they coming from? What is their background? I'm coming by flight, sitting there. I'm going to be there for maybe one or two weeks and go back home. But what is what are they going through? So I was reading about Odisha and and really just brought so much of uh, you know not a fear but a, a respect for that that city because of what happened. The place that we went was about um, maybe about a hundred, hundred and twenty kilometers away from Kandamal. And I read about those persecutions that happened and how people stood in faith and uh, how many of them were martyred for Christ. They gave their life for Christ without even a flinch. They didn't say, no, I, I will turn back. No, it's OK. Don't kill. No. And I saw the faith that these people live in. And it was really such a moving experience for me. So when I went there, I began to understand, OK, these people are going through this season and this is their challenge so so this is an area which i can help them out in so even when i'm preparing for you know uh, my teaching material i'm thinking in their context now when i teach i'm, th I'm thinking in a city context right okay we all are here in a context of a city but we also need to understand who we are ministering to what is the audience what is their background? And that's why history comes in so important. So also learn about the economy of the place. Right? Um, you know, cities usually have a great economy. India as a whole, our economy has been rising. That's good. Uh, but you've heard of the saying, you know, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. Understand the economy of that city or the town that you're living in. What are the people? What is their... Uh, what what work do they do? I was in uh, Kohima, and uh, one of the things I asked the pastor there is, what do people do here? Because it was all like small businesses, right? farmers, and you know they're cultivating crops, or people in transport business, very small town. But it started to grow, and there's a lot of things that are happening now. But mostly the jobs are government jobs, smaller jobs economy is not very great there right so like that you find out what is the economy what what are the kind of people that are there and how will you and i minister to them right everyone with me yes okay then you look at demographics when you say demographics we see there uh, on your notes age distribution of population language cultural backgrounds, senior citizens, young people. So what are the demographics? For example, in a city, you may get a lot of youth coming into a church. But in a town, you may not have a lot of youth. Just an example, right? You may just have couples, families coming in. And then in villages, you may have a lot of old people, senior citizens coming. So you understand the demographics. Right? Now, for example, in Bangalore, uh, I was sharing in the other class in uh, the local church that we must be adaptable. So for example, um, we were talking about, we're going to be talking about end times from tomorrow, from this coming Sunday onwards. So we're talking about end times, but we've got you know so many teens in the church. Now, out of 10 teens, one team may be interested in end times. 
the others are not interested in end times because they are going through their own challenges. As teens, they may be going through, you know, pressure, peer pressure in school or college. They may be going through, uh, you know, challenges in relationships, uh, identity crisis, so many things that teens are going through. Now, as a leader, we must be able to identify. And that's how we started the whole teen church. We started it because we realized that, hey, we are preaching on Sunday. We are having a Sunday worship. We are preaching. People are being ministered to. We go back home. But are we targeting the audience? Right? Are we targeting the teens? And teens are important, right? Because they are our next generation. We need teens to learn. We need them to understand. But we need to target their problem. Do you remember we talked about faith and science, right? 2023, we talked about faith and science. So many of them were, you know, it was not going through for them. Teens, uh, they were trying to, uh, you know, grasp around this whole thing. Maybe they were not interested. So we understood that, hey, we need to, you know, target this audience also. So then in 24, we plan to start the, sorry, 23, late 23, we plan to start the teen church. Right. And it's been going good because they're, they're talking about things that they are going through, their challenges around their demography, around their lifestyle, what's happening, right? And there are leaders who are ministering to them, right? Then you got uh, language. Our, for example, APC, we're only English, but we it's not like, okay, we're an English church, we'll do it only in English. No, we want to also target others, other languages. So that's why we have the short-term Bible college, right? And then we translate in Hindi. So we're able to minister to Hindi people. And uh, we also have the books, the publications. We want to translate it, send it out. And we have so many uh, translations available. Why are we doing that? So that we understand, hey, Bangalore and our nation of India has a mix of many people. So I need to be able to target each one of them, each language group at least. Right? Then you look at cultural backgrounds. What is the background of people? Right? Now, if, you, if it's a city, what is the cultural background? At least 90% of them will know English or will, know, will be educated, 90% of them. Right? So you understand, OK, these people are learned people. They understand. So, I can preach this way, I can teach this way, I can minister in a certain way. Uh, but then, for example, when the same course, when we go to missions or when we go to North India, we can't teach it the way we teach it here. Because it may, they may not understand it. And uh, topics like end times, we don't even choose end times when we go to uh, North India and teach. Because it, it may not go through. right? We just take topics like healing and deliverance, faith, praise and worship. These are topics that they can engage in. So we understand the cultural background. Uh, and so there will be different demographies. As a leader, as we prepare, we must be able to... I'm not saying now, see, you're planning to start a church. Uh, you know, why should I look at all these different groups of people? First, let me start. First, let me let 50 people come. Then we'll think about all that. Yes, that's good. But remember what, you know, I like what Pastor said, I was listening to the message. You know, he went and he was teaching in those Bible colleges and he kept it in his mind. I think one of you asked the question, no, how did you start the Bible college? And he gave a brilliant answer. He said, I went to these places, I saw, and it was like, okay, I'm going to do it. It was there and soon you will do it. So it's always good to start off. When you're starting off, you start off with, Preparation, right? Now, these are the things that you can keep in mind. <laughs> then you have socioeconomic issues. Now, when it comes to issues, issues are going to be so many, right? Uh, now, one thing I would say is don't stress out on all these problems that are happening, right? Of course, our focus is to plant a church. Our focus is to minister to people, to get people into the kingdom of God. But it's not like in a way that I spend all my time trying to look at what is the social, what is the economy of the country, what is what are the people doing. They're not focusing too much on that. We're just getting a rough idea of what's happening. 
right? You know, I was in Sydney, uh, and uh, one of the churches that I went to, I, I when I went there, I, I I saw the people, right? It's so different. The lifestyles are so different compared to India, and the church. But one of the things is the church is very similar to India, right? Oh, the especially the independent church, very similar to I would say very similar to APC as well. Right? They have the same kind of fellowship, same kind of worship, uh, announcements, very, very similar. And I was little, very surprised to see the way they do it. But um, but there is a, you know, the, the, the kind of people are very different. Right? I, I don't know how to explain it. Uh, so I knew that, OK, this is the way ministry can be done in this city. You have a Bible college there, Monday to Friday, very few people will come. You have any events Monday to Friday, very, very few people will come. Right? If it's evening, maybe some people may come Right? If on a weekday. But on a Saturday evening, people will come. Right? Sunday evening, people don't come right? because they want to do all their whole house shows and then start the week again. So it's kind of similar, but you can make out the difference. OK, the ministry here is done this way. And in the ministry in another city or another town is done another way. So uh, these are things that just for us to get a rough idea, right? Uh, so don't go back and, you know, oh, I'm going to plant a church, so let me open Google and read the whole thing. No, just get a rough idea of what's happening. Again, education. Um, what is the education system uh, that's prevalent, right? Um, uh, is it English medium schools or the regional languages? How is the education? Uh, you get an understanding of that. Um, distribution of educational institutions. Are there some good institutions? Now, this is important because later on, when your ministry you know, is planted or your church is planted, you're growing, this is a place where you can tap into. Right? Uh, and I've shared this many times you know when we went to mangalore uh it was just one college that we tried to tap into but through that one college we got doors open for about eight or nine colleges right and this became a door everyone you know everyone in these colleges knew that okay from all people's church or from apc somebody's coming to teach our scriptures and life skills and all of that so it opens a door for us to do ministry right uh, then you can look at what are the major industries, the industrial hubs, what are women workers, especially women. What is the what is the feel of of women in that demography? Now, for example, if you go to a village, very very few women work. They're mostly at home looking after uh, the family. If you go to towns, you may find women working, right? Because again, a town means more expenses people you know one income wouldn't suffice so the wife also may be working these would be simple maybe simple jobs but then when you come into a city it's totally different you know you got women who are ceos women who are started their own companies who are millionaires who are you know very well learned and up the ladder so so again we get an understanding okay so if i start a church and I wanted to start a women's ministry, how should that women's ministry be? Right. Now, in a city, the women's ministry is going to be different. Example, Bangalore, women's ministry is different. If you go to a town, it's going to be different. If you go to a village, it will be very basic women's ministry. Right. Maybe a few people getting together praying. That can be your ministry. Right. So we need to understand what are the, uh, you know, what how I can, um, you know, minister to, to the people. Then unemployment, what is what is happening in terms of unemployment? Are there too many people unemployed? Is 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 the is that city or the town, you know, is there a high rate of unemployment? Um, so you try to understand that. Uh, disabled population, prison system, accident rate, homeless. Now, the reason we want to know about all of this is so that we can keep it in prayer. Right. These are those that we can ask for. Now, I know of a couple of ministries um, in Mumbai where uh, uh, they, the ministries are focused on uh, red light 
prostitution, helping the prostitutes, right? very focused on that. And there's a favor from God. So whenever they go in, whenever they, you know, especially when it's Christmas or Easter, they go, they have these prayers and carols and all of it. Uh, the police give them permission. Right? So that's just that's, that's a favor of God upon their ministry. Uh, then we have, then I know ministries who are, uh, who help the homeless, right? Prison ministries. Um, so if the Lord is leading you towards any of those doors, you can go ahead, right? You can you can you know take that step. Now many people have asked us, you know, why 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 don't we don't we do prison ministry or why don't we do helping for the homeless? Yes, we do support, but we haven't really stepped into that area yet. So remember when. When it comes to a local church, we all are one. When when the Lord Jesus sees us, we are one, right? We are one church. But as a local church, God, the Lord Jesus, gives us certain roles and responsibilities. He opens so, certain doors that he would want this church or this ministry to do, right? Uh, or, or he will open certain, he'll grant us favor in certain areas where you say, okay, this ministry will be doing this, right? So we can always keep it in prayer. Right? Uh, if you see the five days of prayer, we have prayed for these you know, people around us. They prayed for our city, for our nation. We pray for all of this. So the question here is, why is it important to understand the natural dynamics of the city? Why do you think it's important? Because we, we know it's important. Anyone would like to just share a thought? Why do you think, now, for example, um, Francis, you're from Kerala, right? You're going by, what's your hometown? Uh, Trivandrum. OK, so in Trivandrum, you go back to Trivandrum, and your dad says, I want you to go to a new part of Trivandrum and plant a church. Why is it important? To know the natural dynamics of that part of the city. Why do you feel it's important? Anyone can share. Okay, I'm just. Uh... Oh, yeah. Um, so, like planting a church is not about only going and preaching. We had to walk there, right? Yeah. Like, so for that, it must be like understandable. Like instead of okay randomly okay one day i want to do a church it's not like that if, if we have prepared and if we well know about the place it's easy for us or, mm. us only to work uh, yeah so one of the things that as he as francis was talking is one of the things that uh, i was speaking to a pastor and he was saying you know we don't do ministry after 6 pm it was a town it's a, he's, he's from a town he said we don't do ministry after 6 pm because uh, he said there is so much of burglary that happens, like people stop you and you know all of those things happen. So after six or seven p.m., we don't do ministry. And he he learned that the hard way, right? Meaning he went through a certain uh, he he got attacked by a few people and all of it. And th then he realized it's a common thing that happens in the city. Because initially, when he went, he was wondering why nobody is outside after seven p.m. in that town that he was ministering. Uh, but then later he realized that this is it's a common thing it's not like you're a pastor so i'll catch you and be you. anybody right it was uh, not a safe place so you understand these small things small dynamics what else why do you, why do you feel that we must know Uchira, what do you feel about uh, maybe you, uh, if it's assam you're in assam now and then uh, you know you want to plant a church in Nagaland. What 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 do you? Why should you know about Nagaland? It will be easy for me to con uh, like uh, uh, what to say communicate, uh, communicate. Yeah, uh, to the people and the culture. If I will don't know anything, they will not come to me and talk to me. So yeah, yeah, that's a good point. No, communicate. I must know how to communicate. Remember Hudson Taylor, one of the uh, missionaries. He was an American who went to uh, China. So first he was ministering there. Nobody is listening to him. He said, God, what is this? Why? Nobody is listening to me. You sent me to uh, China to minister. Nobody is listening. Nobody is bothered. Only I've been here for so many years. Nothing's happening. 
And as he was praying, he felt the Holy Spirit telling him, become like them. So what he did was he went uh, and he he learned how to wear, you know, those Chinese, they wear those really tight clothes. So he bought those. He learned how to wear that. And he also, you know, they had these small ponytail kind of thing. So he started growing that. And of course, he he was learning the language, the Chinese language, and he learned it. He became very more, very fluent. He started going to you know places where there were a lot of Chinese people sitting with them with that you know uh, dress and uh, using the forks or whatever, eating their kind of food, trying to be among them. And it was only after I think about seven odd years that people started listening to him. So he would share the gospel, and people say, "Hey." He looks, doesn't look Chinese, but he's wearing everything that we are. Maybe he's one of us. And they began to listen to him. Hudson Taylor's did a great ministry uh, in, in, in China and, uh, uh, you know, just blessing uh, uh, many lives in China, bringing in the gospel into China. Uh, so it was a simple thing that God told him, become one of them. And all he did was change the way he looked, change the way he ministered to people, and that was effective. Anyone else would like to share? Nobody wants to look. <laughs> OK, uh, let me share one thing that happened to me. OK, so I was in Bangalore. And all my life, I'm in Bangalore. But when I went to the city of Mangalore, it was a shift. Right? Now imagine this. This is just like what? Uh, maybe 350, 400 kilometers away. But it was a shift in thinking. Right? Now, what happened was the church was small, but something was off. I was trying to do ministry like how I do in Bangalore. And uh, I said, okay, we'll do this, we'll do this. Here. Normally in Bangalore, you do, an, you do, like, for example, a worship evening, you'll have some people coming in, right? So I said, OK, let's do this. Then I realized, after a you know, couple of months at least, I realized that people here are very different to Bangalore. Even though it's just 350 kilometers away, it, they're very different. The way they think, the way they, uh, you know, the way they look at church, the way they think about ministry, what their idea about ministry, it's very different. right? And so I had to understand them. See, for them, Saturday is a day of rest. Don't call me anywhere. Nowhere. Don't call me for worship evening. Don't call me for any programs, any conference. Don't call me. I will not come. Now, in Bangalore, we have all our events only on Saturday. right? Then that's one thing. Two. In the evenings, they don't want to pick up calls. After 7, 8 o'clock, they don't like to be on the phone. You know, So Zoom also, they don't want. So then I realized, hey, so how, what, what is it that, the, you know, why, why are they like this? Now, it's not their fault. It's the culture that was there a long time back. Sunday morning, nobody works. Very few people work. So we were struggling to find a vendor to give, bring coffee. Everyone are closed. So one guy said, sir, I'll make it home. You tell me what time, I'll bring it and come. You know, it was so hard because uh, I think I've shared, right? The first Sunday I reached there, I was going to church. Everything is closed. So I called up Bangalore and I said, is it like a government holiday or some band or something that uh, nobody's around? I said, no, everything's fine. But I went there, nobody on the streets. I thought, this is very strange, right? But then I realized over time that, hey, this is how people are. Sunday, they don't want to do anything. Right? Maybe Sunday afternoon, they may want to, you know, they, they'll come to church. They may stay back for a while, but not for long. Now, it was a challenge for me. But just because it's a challenge doesn't mean we say, hey, this is how it is. Right? God is bigger than cultural things that are already there. God can break those cultural barriers. So, you know, we I purposely used to say, you know, Saturday is worship evening. I cannot keep it any other day. It's very simple. I used to tell them, you know, in the church, 
it has to be a saturday monday to friday people are working by the time they travel home it's late they cannot come for a worship so it has to be saturday now the choice is yours you have to come you have to be there if you want to be blessed you have to come and suddenly there was a change right over time people started coming for worship evening people started understanding okay i need to be part of these things then we started doing school of ministry saturday morning to 3 hours 3 or 4 hours right morning to afternoon and then we send them back home for for the rest of the day so that also was a challenge but i understood that it's like a breaking a barrier a cultural barrier i'm not expecting 50 60 people to come but i'm expecting few people to come so that that barrier is broken that cultural barrier and so over time people understood okay school of ministry 3 hours instead of sitting at home i might as well go and sit there right so people started so i gave them some practical ideas morning you wake up finish your cooking finish cooking lunch also and come so when you go back home your lunch is ready heat the food eat it now and so over time people started coming so uh, what i noticed was even though these cultural barriers were there as a leader we may have to take a step to break those cultural barriers and the holy spirit will do the work for that he will help us but he say you 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 do it and he'll give us the ideas and eventually we, i saw that there were you know when we had school of ministry and all here there used to be 30 40 people coming in and in bang mangalore for a saturday first half it's a big deal but that barrier was broken saturday is a rest day no i can also go to church i can be part of ministry i can be part of what god is doing in the city uh, and and then we also did outreaches outreaches was something that was out of their mind it was not even part of their lifestyle but i you know slowly i would tell them you come with me just stand with stand with us and we are ministering so again that cultural barrier was broken right so it is very important that when we are planting a church when we're looking at a church we understand these barriers but these barriers should not stop us from doing what god wants us to do I shouldn't say oh these are the barriers so I don't think I can do a good ministry here remember planting of the church is very small portion of the work is ours god is the one who will build the church that's his promise right i was sharing with the other class also that day right uh, uh, for many years i was i was depending on myself when it came to church planting church growth i was depending on myself why because i felt okay i know how to lead worship i know how to evangelize i'm not afraid of anyone so i can go and preach i can go i know i can do it so there was a lot of i in that you know i know that god has given me the grace i know that god has given me the gifts i don't need anybody i can lead the worship alone worship evening i'll lead alone i can i i'll go alone and do ministry outside no problem and i can do evangelism outside no problem so i always felt i can do it but after many months i realized that hey it's not working out i became physically drained out i was physically drained out i was just tired every time my mind was tired every time my body was tired i tell myself why am i feeling this way i'm not even 40 why am i feeling so tired why am i feeling so stressed out and i realized it was because i was putting all the pressure on myself and one day you know god just ministered to me zechariah 46 saying it is not by might it is not by power but it is by the holy spirit and there was a shift all of a sudden i felt i'm not going to carry this burden going to let it go and i let the holy spirit work and there was a shift in the way ministry was done right so the point i'm trying to make is every city every town every village wherever you are you will see cultural you know uh, barriers the holy spirit can break those barriers right so don't limit yourself don't limit what god wants to do and he's calling you so uh this will help us get a feel of the city as a whole this will help us pray 
or the city, develop a heart of compassion towards the city. That's very important. Remember Jesus? He went up the mountain of transfiguration. He came down and there were crowds of people there. His heart was moved with compassion. Right? He looks over Jerusalem and he weeps. His, his heart is moved with compassion. If we do not have a heart for the city, we cannot do much. So when we pray, we say, God, give me the heart. That when I see people who are lost, that my heart should say, God, somehow, you know, if it's not me, somehow this person should know the gospel. Somehow he, should, he or she should know that Jesus is a savior who can save this person from sin. And that heart should be there. Now, I'm not saying it is easily, it's there for everyone, no. But when we pray, God gives us that heart. Right? When we look at uh, history, church history, and God using these men and women of God, it was not like they had the heart all the time. Right? Uh, Adoree Ram Jats and William Carey, they all wanted to do ministry. But William Carey initially didn't want to come to India. But he came, and then he developed a heart for the city. Right? And for the nation of India, and he was able to do so much. He had a heart. Imagine William Carey, you know, in his art, in his book, he writes about the Sati movement. You heard about the Sati movement, right? Where the woman was also burnt. Um, so he went and he saw this in, and he didn't understand. Now he's coming from a different country. Husband died. Why do you want to kill the wife? So for him, it was something he couldn't understand. But there was a compassion in his heart. She didn't do anything wrong. Why would you want to burn her for that? And so he abolished the Sati movement. But he he towards it and he he you know he made sure that this movement was stopped because he had a compassion, a heart for this for the people. This also allows us when we get a feel of the city, it allows us, allows God to place specific area of needs of the city in our hearts. Right? So we're praying for the city. God will put certain areas of the city. He put certain, you know, he may put youth in your heart. He may put drug addictions or those who are homeless or child uh, abuse, child prostitution that's happening. He may put certain things in our heart. It is the Holy Spirit who puts it. Right? Uh, for example, look at Mother Teresa. She came to India. God had put the heart for her, for lepers. You cannot go next to a leper and sit. You know, the Jewish traditions for a leper when during Jesus' time, they had to be 10 feet away, 10 to 20 feet away. On a windy day, 50 feet away, because the air also shouldn't come near them. In the temples, they had a small door, and that small door would open and go into kind of something like a basement and the lepers would go there pray and they were only allowed to go before the sunrise and after the sunset late at night right because there was such a stench they were the outcasts of society now imagine this woman mother teresa she is going cleaning their wounds you know, bandaging them, it cannot be done by her own strength. It is the Holy Spirit who puts it. Now you ask me to do it. I don't think I'll be able to do it. Because I don't have the grace for that. But when we are praying for the city, God gives us the grace for different areas in our city. Right? And then again, this will be important for us to develop strategies uh, to minister in the city. So. Even as we pray, God will give us the strategies. What to do, how to do, when to do it, right? uh, what kind of uh, methods to use. Right? So just an example I'll give you, and then we'll take a break. One of the areas that we were at APC thinking of was, how do we minister to the men? Right? And the men are working Monday to Friday, mostly. They come on Sunday. But how do we minister to them, right? Uh, usually, men are on the quieter side, right? They don't talk too much. Uh, not all, everyone, but they're mostly very reserved, working. And so, how do we 
create groups where men can minister to men. So they don't have to always come to the pastor. Right? And they sometimes they may feel a hey, pastor is busy or they're all busy. They have a lot of things to do. But how can we create a culture where men can reach out to other men and help each other out? Right? Or even get to know each other. Because they just say hi on Sundays and go back. And they probably meet the next Sunday. Or if somebody is going through a challenge, they won't even know that this person is going through a challenge. They may be sitting next to each other. So one of the things we did was we came up with something called as a men's breakfast fellowship. Right? Now, why did we come up with this? We thought about it. Monday to Friday, not possible. Right? Because they are working. Now, Saturday, the men normally want to stay at home or they have things to do during the day. So what can we do that we should not you know, uh, interfere with their schedule? Because they ha may have a lot of things. But somewhere incorporate uh, something, a fellowship, so that they can get to know each other. So we thought of a breakfast fellowship. Start at 8 o'clock in the morning, end at 10 o'clock. So then they can go back home. And they can do what they have to do. So we thought about it. Now, we don't know, we didn't know what the response will be, whether people will register, whether they won't register. But we tried it out. And when we tried it, it kind of worked because we had more than 40, 50 people registering. So that was a good number, right? So because people are getting to know each other. Then we did it again. About 60 people came. And people, because of that, people got to know each other. And they, you know, we didn't tell them. They exchanged phone numbers. Hey, you stay here. I didn't know it. You stay just two away. Uh, and there were two or three men who stay in the same apartment and they didn't know. Same apartment complex. So what they decided was, hey, let's meet and we'll do a prayer walk in the morning around the apartment. So three of them around the apartment. How did it all start? Because of the breakfast fellowship. Right? And then there was another group of people, of men who said, hey, uh, we, we'll, we'll get together and we go for a prayer walk around the city. I go for jogging in the morning, so you, you, why don't you also come? It was a simple thing. It was not a very big event, but simple thinking so that you know, we don't disturb their day. Now, if we say morning to afternoon, men's program. I'm sure it's going to be difficult for them to come because they have other things to do. This is just some thought that came. And it helped in, but we're building on that. It's not like that's that's it. But we're building on it, trying to uh, build fellowship, increase. So even as we pray, God will give us the strategies. God will give us the idea how to do, when to do. But we have uh, you know, uh, at least a backdrop what are the dynamics, natural dynamics of that place in that city or town? Then we'll be able to plan effectively. All right? Yes? Okay, we'll take a break. We'll come back and we'll get into chapter six.